Acris is a platform that many of us know and use and love. And in this episode, which is the third in our series that we've been doing, we're going to be covering some of the various new products that Acris has brought to market, not only this year, but also some of the stuff that's hopefully coming in the near future and how you can use it in your practice to help tech enhance your primary care and learning, not only for yourself, but for your patients as well. So, shall we get started? Hello, EGP learners, and welcome to this stream where we're joined by the team from Accurates talking about some of their new products, including Acumel, which is their big new thing that's available for pretty much everybody to use and stuff. Before we get to that, though, I'm going to let our speakers introduce themselves. So we've got Rob and Stu joining us. Rob, do you want to kick us off? Hi, everyone. Thanks very much for having us on. Um, so I'm Rob. I'm one of the clinical leads at Accurix. So I'm part of a five-person in-house clinical team that we have. Um, previously, I was an NHS ophthalmology registrar, um, and now at Acrix, I work with Stu and a few of the other product teams, kind of as the voice of the healthcare professional and the patient and guide some of our clinical safety work. Cool. And Stu. Hi, everyone. My name's Stu. I am a group product manager at Acrix, working on the product we're going to be talking mainly about today, which is Acumail. Um, and I work with people like Rob and our development team of engineers, designers, researchers to, to figure out what our users um, would find helpful in primary care and secondary care and try and build a product that can make your your days easier in, in your profession and very excited to chat today. Cool. So how about we start off with that first question then? So what exactly is Acumel? Because some of our colleagues out there may not come across it, don't know what it is. And keen to know what it does. So Acumel um, is a product which um, has been around for a little while, but as of a couple of weeks ago, has now been rolled out more widely. So pretty much everyone within in the Wales and Northern Ireland can now access it. Um, and in a nutshell, it's a tool which enables healthcare professionals to contact other healthcare professionals and um, quickly, easily, and securely um, straight from your Acrix toolbar. Um, but in practice, kind of what that actually means is it's a system which sits on top of NHS mail. So from EMIS or system one, whilst you have the toolbar open, you can uh, send messages to other healthcare professionals, taking stuff straight from your clinical system and saving things straight back from the clinical system. And then for the recipient, um, they just receive that message into their normal email. So NHS.net mail, for example. So they don't need to download any software or um, access anything else. So that's sort of the highest level summary. Okay, so basically a patient communication tool that integrates the primary care record with NHS mail to directly send information from person A to person B, hopefully. Exactly, yeah. Awesome, cool. So um, it'd be worthwhile, I guess, seeing how that works. Shall we have a look at that directly? So have a look at the demo and things? Absolutely, let's go for it. Okay, so I'll put it on screen for you. And we're going to go for this lovely little method here. Let's see how we go from there. Perfect. Okay, so I'll give a quick run through of how Acumel works and talk about some of the, the benefits Rob touched on. And we might ask you some questions as we go, Dr. Gandalf, around how you currently do some of these things in, in your practice. Sure. Um, so in the background, we have System 1, which I'm sure most people are familiar with. This works in the exact same way with as it, with EMIS as it does with System 1. Um, but we'll just, we'll just look at System 1 for now. So Acumel is this um, new at symbol that will appear on the green toolbar, which is our Acrix toolbar. And if we open that up, um, as you can see, it looks fairly similar to our patient inbox. Um, and that it has, down the left-hand side, it has a few folders, um, which we've created by default. And down the middle, you have certain conversations which are already in there. And before we come and speak about the inbox, I'll just chat you through the, the basics of sending a message. Um, and then we can see what, what a message looks like when it comes back. So as you can see with all of our products in, in Acurix, we pull through the patient demographic details from the clinical system. So we have our test patient, Mr. Oz Buckbait open here, and we will come back to what these quick actions are and what they're for at the end. But for now, if I just click compose new message, you can see you land on a screen which looks fairly similar to a, to a typical email client with some key differences. So the first one is if you open this drop down, we have a curated directory, which is ICS based. So 
each ICS in the country should have its own directory. And what I'd be keen to know right now, Dr. Gandalf, was how do you how do you in your practice keep track of who's useful to contact in your area and make sure that those are always kept up to date? I have a team of typists who keep that information securely and safely for me without me having to do anything, I hope. And is that's working pretty well at the moment? Um, to a degree, I think, you know, that they struggle sometimes because obviously the internal email addresses for the teams that they're trying to contact do change or the relevant person may change and therefore that upsets the apple cart as a result of it. Um, I think they, uh, the other part of it, obviously, from my perspective is without my typist team, I have no way of doing it. Yeah, that's a fairly typical pattern that we hear from from many other practices and a lot are actually less well equipped to keep up to date their their email addresses and contacts and that mm -hmm. is why this is something that we are quite heavily investing in now so this is our first first iteration of it but a future world that we we hope we can we can reach is a is a very well maintained directory of anyone in the nhs with extra details around them as um with types of information such as when it was last updated how quickly you can expect a response, that type of thing. For now, though, it's not quite there yet, though, though we are working um, towards that in the background. But what you can see is you can, you can search through it. This is a directory which is currently visible to your whole practice. So if you were to make changes to anything here, it would be distributed across your whole practice so anyone could use it. So if you had a locum join and you wanted to make sure that they knew the the correct person to email about a specific a specific problem you you might be having in cardiology say you could make sure that that was in the notes of this contact to say please contact this person about xyz for now though i'll go ahead and select this contact and you can see that it pulls out the service um, that that contact is a part of and the organization in this instance it's a pharmacy contact though it's of course, my own contact is within a test environment. And going going down the screen, then we can see that we have a selection of preset templates that have been made by us. Again, this is something we're going to be looking at and updating. And hopefully, in some point in the near future, you'll be able to create your own templates. And if we scroll down, we can see that there is a referral to CPCS, so our community community pharmacy consultation service. And what this does is it dumps in pre a pre-made template, gives you the option to put in a reason for referral, and then pulls the patient's phone number through from the clinical system so that the pharmacy can then get in touch with the, the patient to arrange a consultation. So if I just put in an example, um, we can then go down and look at the remaining two parts of forming a message. And those two are attaching. So this is just attaching a document as you would to any other email. But the key benefit here is that you can do it directly from your clinical system. So this will go and check um, all the documents which are saved to your patient's records so that you can pull something through in one click instead of having to find it, download it, save it in the correct format and upload it to an email address. And the final one is this create patient record summary. This is Probably not useful in this example, but if you were referring into a more complex um, service, you might want to give them some extra information around this patient without ha them having to come back and ask it explicitly. So you can just click attach and that will attach directly to the email. Um, before we hit send, we something we've recently added is this save to records or the option to, to not save to record, I should say. Um, Something we often hear is that with patient access that's coming around and patients being able to see things that are on the records, professionals don't always want their email addresses being visible there. So we've added the option to not save it to record in case you don't want that email to be visible. Now, though, I'll go ahead and click send. Um, that's fired off. And what we can see, again, with all other Acrix products, this is now saved to the records. Uh, because we chose to save it so that saves you having to copy and paste it into the record and now gives you that audit trail so you can see where your patient's been referred um we will now take uh take you to look at what it looks like for the recipient so that um we can show you what 
you you can expect your recipients to see if you start using this. Um, so now I will jump to this is my email client. This is Gmail because we're on our test environment, but you can imagine it works the exact same way with NHS.net. And if I click the top email, you can see this is the the referral that is just being sent as part of CPCS. And the crucial thing you can see here, see here is that it is um, quote unquote just an email to the recipient. So as Rob mentioned, the recipient doesn't need to be on any type of special system in order to receive these. Um, I'll now go ahead and click reply so you can see what it looks like when it comes back in. Um, and while we wait for that to come back, I'll jump back into Acumail and we'll talk about some of these quick actions. So some of these, the quick actions that we've pulled out are some of the top use cases that we've heard people are using Acumail for and the things that it helps them, um, helps them with most in reducing the admin burden. So another question for you, Dr. Gandalf, do you, um, how does your practice currently send and deal with um, referrals which aren't sent through ERS, so perhaps that's community or imaging referrals? Um, so if, we're, if they're not sent through ERS, then we normally have to send them through different portals or direct to individual email addresses or that kind of stuff because obviously they don't accept it through the normal route. Um, so multi-channel, I think is probably the best way of describing it. And, and would that normally be something that you as as the GP would be doing or would that usually be something that perhaps you'd create a task in EMS or System 1? So I typically have. create, yeah, I typically create the task of the content of what the response would be, and then that would be processed by again my um, secretarial typist pool and stuff. Um, Ninety nine percent of the time, unless I felt really, really strongly, in which case I'm normally picking up the phone to the person. Perfect. And that's a again a, a fairly typical pattern we hear from from non ERS referrals, and that is for those that are saying those mul um, sort of multi-system, those which are sent through e through email, we've tried to streamline that for you as much as possible. So if we take a community referral mm -hmm. and one of the quick actions we've made is, is a community referral. So if we click this, we know that the majority of community referrals are sent with a, a document that is saved in the patient's records. Um, and a, again, you can select this in one click. So we'll take this referral example, click attach. And the other thing we heard was that more often than not, the email to which you should send that form is on the form itself. So mm -hmm. we've built a system that can scan that form for email addresses. Okay. Um, and in this example, it's found my email address because it's a test and this example email address of NHS.net. So now I can just click this one. We have pre-selected a new referral template for you. We've attached it. Um, so all that's left to do is for you to go ahead and, ahead and click send now. So one of the one of the benefits we've heard this um, this result in for some of our GP practices is that actually it's quick it's now quicker for the GP to send the referral themselves than it is to task their admin. That isn't true across the board and isn't a shift mm -hmm. that we can everyone do, but it is things we've started seeing happening, which means that we can free up um medical secretaries and admin teams to do other forms of work to help the practice run more smoothly um so it's these quick actions that we're trying to invest in as well so that we can streamline as many of the email flows as possible now just to go back to the what an email looks like in response when you get it back into your practice level inbox this is a response that in blue peter style we did earlier um, so that it came back into the inbox. That's the latest one just arrived now. And in here, you can see that that was the CPCS referral we sent out. And you've then got the response underneath of thanks received. There are um, a number of options you can now take on this. If, if they had asked for more information, you can come down and click reply as you could with any other email. Or if it was you got your response back and that was the end of of um, the communication that was required. You could choose to save that to records and then you could choose to mark it as done. 
um, so that you can keep, keep your inbox clear. Again, very similarly as it works in our patient inbox. Or if you wanted to and you needed some information from your colleague, so let's say that my colleague Alex, who is in the office at the moment, I wanted uh, another opinion. Uh, have your opinion, please. I could ask, I could assign this to him with a note so that this will then appear in his Acumel inbox and he can get back to me with his his opinion on that referral and the, and the request that they came back with. That then leads us on to this left-hand side of what each of these folders mean. So mm -hmm. this assigned to me, or assigned to you, sorry, I should say, is, an, is anything which is a conversation which I have been a part of. So to make sure that you are always notified of the relevant things, um, I am only notified of the, th of the conversations that come back in here. So I don't get a notification for everything else. Everything else would be this all folder, which is all conversations which happen in your practice. And the reason we have this folder is so that there are siloed conversations when so that if people go on annual leave or they can't come in for a few weeks for whatever reason, you can still go on and check their, their, their conversations and make sure that nothing gets missed. And then the final one is this unassigned folder. And this uh, folder is, is to capture any um, inbound, which isn't in response to a, to a conversation that you sent outbound. So it's, it's, it would be messages started by those in secondary community or, or pharmacy or any, or any of the non GP settings. And then you could select who within your practice you wanted to, to manage this unassigned folder. Um, and that is. Acumel in a nutshell, certainly the GP side of it um, for now. And we can touch on how the, the we're helping the non-GP side of Acumel. Um, but we just, just want to check first if there was any follow-up questions you had to that for now, Dr. Gandalf. Okay. So I guess if I was to ask you both, if we were to summarize from your perspective as the guys that have created and developed this, what do you see as the main benefits of Acumel, first of all? I think, uh, Steve, shall I go? So I think um, broadly there are, there are three main benefits. So number one is because you are integrated into admission system one, so you're integrated into your clinical system, you can send and receive messages and save stuff straight to the record um, very quickly, single clicks, and hopefully it's reducing that system hopping and those different um, systems you're having to use um, just to make everything that much quicker and easier. Um, number two, is our inbox management tools. So we're trying to make it so that just like with our patient messaging inbox, anything that's coming through into your Acumel inbox, you can easily assign to other colleagues, you have visibility over everything that's going on in the practice. And we want to reduce the chance as low as possible of anything going missing. Um, and then thirdly is um, the directory piece that um, Stu was talking about. So we're rolling out this new directory um, and increasingly people find that you'll have more and more services in your local ICS built into that and you can add contacts yourself. So ultimately we want to get to the point where we have the most comprehensive local directory you have. So find, make it as easy as possible to find whatever contact or service you need um, mm -hmm. in your area. And, and to support that, we're adding in functionality like activity marking. So uh, for local services, we'll be able to show how often other users are contacting that address, what the typical read times are, response times, to try and give you the data you need to work out what is a trusted and useful contact. Cool. I know in the chat we've had a few questions specifically around, I guess, the way it works and, and, and that kind of stuff. So I guess if I was to bring on a couple of those that are probably more relevant to what we're talking about here. Um, so I guess one is how, how much use of this is there already in secondary care? And that's from unknown user. Yeah. So in terms of um recipients in secondary care at the moment where there's in the in the region of sort of 50,000 to 60,000 acumules being sent out per week from mm -hmm. from this tool which means there are um 
around that number landing in inboxes. Not all of those are in, are unique recipients, of course. There's a lot sent to, to the same. Um, but there are a lot of quote unquote users or recipients of this at the moment. When we talk more about the the secondary care side of initiating a conversation, there's significantly fewer, but that's because we haven't started rolling this out because we want GPs to be comfortable with it first. Okay. I guess that brings me on to my next question then. So that primary secondary care interface, how do you see that changing over the coming months, particularly with Acumail now being able to send a two-way communication tool and stuff? How, how do you see that changing? We we certainly hope that we can affect um, quite significant change in that, um, particularly with the, the biggest one from primary care out is we're hoping to help with understanding who and how to contact people um, mm -hmm. with that directory piece on the secondary care or tertiary or far or community in. One of the things we are we're we're trying we're hoping to try and roll out is when when we get as many GPs as possible on Acumail as possible as possible we can with just a patient nhs number and date of birth we can give a secondary care professional an immediate access into a gp practices toolbar which is something that we have heard from secondary care is like light years from where we are now because of how difficult it can be to find gp contact details um and it is we're therefore hoping to open up much easier communication channels between primary and secondary and i think really importantly just to add to that it's about not just opening up the channels but opening up that channel as a two-way piece so if you have you know if you in primary care receive a discharge letter let's say or an outpatient commit letter um you might well have a query about it and with current systems often that's quite hard to go back to that person or that yeah. service but we want to make that as easy as possible so you can just simply reply hopefully get very quick clarification whatever your question might be mm -hmm. okay um i know we're getting more and more questions coming in about the way that acumel works and stuff and things um i guess just before we get to those kind of things is there other stuff that you think is going to come out of this or how, how do you see this changing or, or more other things i guess uh, what do you see coming from accurate in the near future one of the things we're we're considering um quite prominently at the moment is how we could work more closely with ERS because we know that the electronic referral system is, is um, a system which is mandated in certain parts of the country and through which a lot of referrals go and through no fault of anyone's we know that ERS isn't often the easiest to use and we would like to try and help in that regard. So in an effort to try and bring down the number of systems which people have to use day to day, um, along with this sort of system hopping, which Rob mentioned, an integration with ERS is something that we're heavily considering in the coming months. Um, so that that can then also make it much easier to have a conversation about a referral instead of not knowing how to get back to the person who's referred to you, be that on primary or secondary care. We're also beginning to do creating amounts of work around specific templates for, for sort of high value use cases. So one example that Stu mentioned is the community pharmacy consultation service. So we know that you know, there's a lot of push for that. So we've built a sort of um, first template for that, but we want to, um, based on some of the great user feedback we're already starting to get, add functionality to that. So we've had a lot of people ask about adding SNOMED codes into those templates. So that's something that we're looking at very seriously. Um, so we hope to be able to continuously um, add features to these templates and, and more templates for both primary and secondary care as, as we go. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So I think at this point, we're going to go to some of the Q&A that we've had. Um, so in terms of, you know, tackling some of those challenges that our colleagues are facing and stuff, we've had a, a fair couple of comments come through already. Um, so let me just uh, bring it on in terms of what, so we've had, um, one from again we seem to have quite a lot of anonymous facebook users joining us today um is there any way to hide the email address from the patient record so i guess this relates to the fact you mentioned obviously it saves the information to the record does it also save the email addresses within the patient record when you do that it currently does um if you choose to to keep it as checked to save to the to the record it also saves the email address mm -hmm. um as i mentioned as we went through the demo we've we've heard that patient access is more and more of a um, initiative being driven and therefore people don't want their personal 
part of their work, but personal identifiable email addresses in there. So as well as not saving the whole thing to record, one of the things we're considering as a team is, is there a way we can save just the content and the identifiable display name to the to the to the record without actually saving the email address but that isn't something that's yet available okay i can definitely understand the questions and concerns because also you're sharing i guess the other individual's email address potentially into the record as well which you may or may not have consent for so i guess the ig side of it is, is something that i think you know that does need to be clarified uh, and i don't know if there's any disclaimers that go out in terms of the initial communications to the other individuals, obviously, that information may be saved in the patient record and stuff. But I guess, um, yeah, keen, glad to hear that it's being considered in terms of how that could be more streamlined and, and stuff. Um, there's a comment, I guess, from another, uh, I don't know if it's the same person. Um, I think there needs to be a lot more work on the back ends, um, or ends rather than sends, of the inboxes for staff uh, that these look after these. I think there's too much emphasis on individual users managing their inbox, but in reality, staff are supported by admin staff. I can also see the concern of that in terms of obviously as many clinicians work part time, obviously their inboxes may not be available all the time and, and you know, in terms of being live access and stuff. So management across um, when staff are not available or not able to do with it lively. I know obviously that happens currently with a lot of the patient triage um, inboxes and stuff, and it's a massive requested feature. I guess from your perspective, how do you see that moving forward? Um, so that's, you know, that's a really good bit of feedback and it's something that we are giving a lot of thought to. So there's a few pieces of that. So the first is that um, from the demo that Stu shows you, you remember there were, there were three views we have of our inbox. And the third one is the all view. So from that, you can see all messages that anyone in your practice has sent or received. So there is that visibility piece that's um, made available to everyone in practice. Um, but then in the future, we want to think about just like we have with patient messaging inbox, we want to think about adding the function to um, be able to assign to certain teams rather than just individuals. And um, so add more um, in terms of that assignment piece. Cool. Okay. Um, so another question. Um, so it would be more useful in the admin area to carry out bulk actions and check inbox numbers and stuff, I guess. So having some metrics along the lines of what you receive can be quite useful, I guess, uh, and obviously helpful in terms of um, the administrative capacity in terms of sharing out workload because I know obviously more and more clinicians and practices are working at how does the influx of workload get shared out equitably and stuff. I can definitely see the benefits of that. I had a question about the templates that you had. So obviously you had a couple there in terms of um, CPCS and other kind of things. I know one of the common things that takes potentially a lot of time from an individual user perspective is replying back to secondary care clinicians um, around workload we're being asked to do that we don't feel we need to be doing or shouldn't be doing and stuff. There is guidance on how to reply back to that often using things like the VMA and um, quality matters documents and that kind of stuff. Do you see that as something that could potentially be integrated as a quick action template kind of thing? Um, I appreciate that's using stuff that's possibly outside of the clinical systems in terms of reference material, like the documents and all links to documents and stuff. But yeah, I, I guess that would be, from my perspective, something to be really different. Yeah, that's a very good point. You know, certainly workload shifting is, I think, a challenge in all aspects of the NHS. Um, and that is something we've heard from um, a number of our users. Um, they've heard you know, we've heard that people are already using Acumel for exactly what you're describing. So because there is that sort of comparative ease to go back to a service, um, mm -hmm. actually Acumel is being used um, through reply features as a way to sort of go back and, and push back slightly where perhaps where they shifting seems a little bit um, unreasonable. Um, uh, but the idea of a, a specific template about that, that's not something we've done yet, but actually that's, that's a very interesting idea and something we'll take away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I was just thinking that obviously there is set template guidance in terms of how to respond to those letters and potentially having standardised replies back not only from the practices but also on a wider scale obviously offers an element, I guess, of um, better protection and standardisation. It, it just, you know, it takes in some senses also the emotion out of the situation, which often is the part I think many people get caught up in um, yeah. and actually um, having that quicker response can sometimes be more, I think, useful and means clinicians spending less time at work, which is always a good thing in some ways. Well, inappropriate time at work, 
let's clarify that in case Steve Barkley's watching this <laughs> um, and things. But yeah, inappropriate time of work and things. Um, I guess in terms of how you see Acumel being used, obviously a lot of this focuses around the um, directory of service that you have and, and things. How can practices work on that? I mean, can they change that email directory directly themselves? Is that something they can do or is it something they have to go through the Acurix team or a different kind of setting to adjust and stuff? Absolutely. That, that's something that can be fully customized by each individual practice. So in, in the directory that you have the option to update the each individual contact with your own display name, want to change the service or perhaps the organization set wrongly, um, or you can add new contacts that your your practice specifically uses, but maybe aren't in the IC, ICS directory. You can either do that individually if you've got a few that you want to add, or you can currently there's no bulk upload um, option, but you can email actually myself directly and we'll upload that on 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 our side in the same day. Um, so mm -hmm. that is definitely something that can be can be customized by um, each individual practice. Cool. Can you actually show us what it looks like when you change one of the individual settings and stuff? I think that might be quite useful to, to see if that's okay. Absolutely. So if I come into here and let's say I, I take um, my contact details, so Stuart Pittman, and I think, oh, actually, that it's not actually Ali's Pharmacy, it's a Boots Pharmacy down the road. I could come in to see details, and then you can see the, the, the details about this contact. If I then go to edit and update contact details, in here, you can then update the display name if you wanted. You could add some notes about no longer working on Tuesdays. Um, you could come down and you can say, okay, actually, it's not uh, Ali's pharmacy. Now I'm going to set it to Alan's pharmacy, for instance, because it was in, it was inputted incorrectly. Click save, and then all of it's updated for the whole practice. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. And if you wanted to add a new contact, how could you do that? Would that be through this portal, or would they have to contact you? Yeah. So if they wanted, if you had maybe a handful that you wanted, you can do it one by one. So at the bottom here, there's an add a contact. And in here, if I do, I'll just do this to plus one that, accurate.com, like four. Um, I can then click continue, and then I'll be prompted to enter a display name for this person. Um, four, and then again, you can add any notes you'd like. You can choose the service that they're a part of. Um, if it's maybe a wheelchair service and then the organization and then you can click save and then again that will be in for your whole practice to see if you then had um at what point this comes cumbersome maybe like 10 10 contacts or even five contacts you can send me an excel sheet um and then i will upload all of those all of those contact all of those contacts on our side which means that they'll appear in your practice and we can do that in the same day. Cool, thank you. Um, I know in some places they're moving potentially away from using NHS.net as their email communication tool. Um, so I know there are a couple of ICBs that are apparently making that decision. How would that affect Acumail um, from your perspective? It would not massively affect it. So at the moment it is based on top of NHS.net as we said, and therefore any, when you email any email address, which is on NHS is accredited email or meets their, their, their secure email standards, which all of NHS.net do and a lot of NHS.UK do, um, then it works as normal. However, if, if the ICB has spun up their own email address, which doesn't yet meet NHSE secure email standard, then because we are on NHS.net, we cannot guarantee that it will be end to end encrypted and therefore we'll give you a little warning. Yep. But most, in our experience, most email services which are created by ICBs will have their own security in place and therefore will be secure to handle patient identifiable information. Cool. Okay. And I guess with it using NHS.net, 
and in itself, I guess, just nuts and bolts thing. So if I was to send a communication um, using obviously Acumail, will that then appear in my inbox slash sent mail of my NHS.net account as well? Does it pass over? I guess is probably also describing it. Yeah, that's a really key question and one that we haven't quite figured out how to communicate within the product itself. The short answer mm -hmm. is no. There's a um, there's accounts that we use in the background. So when you first start using Acumail, there is a um, what we call a global account um, that we send everything through. Um, however, if you meet if your practice starts using it quite regularly, we will flip you over to an account which is specific to your practice, which has your ODS code in it. And that then means that everything will be specific to your practice, but also it means that the if for whatever reason a healthcare professional got held of got hold of your practice's email address, they could start sending you new inbound into Acumail. And it's for that reason that we keep you in the global to begin with, so that you can't get uninitiated inbound in case for whatever reason people aren't checking your unassigned folder. Mm -hmm. But as soon as we are we we can see that the practice is active, we'll flip you over so you get a better experience on Acumail. Okay. So I guess just to clarify that a bit further then in terms of some of the stuff you mentioned, could a colleague out in community care or secondary care contact a clinician in general practice? through Acumail if they both had access to it um, when it hadn't been initiated by a practice member team? Not until that, and not until your practice had become active and we consider that having sent 20 messages in the first few weeks. Um, okay. After that point, and we'd flip you over to the to your specific account, then if they got hold of your email address, then they could. There is also so again, as she said, once once your practice is active, we have uh, in secondary care a feature called Message GP, which is uh, what, what Stu touched on earlier, which is where using Acrix Web, which is our platform for secondary community care, healthcare professionals can log in and they can search for a patient using the personal demographic service. And if um, your practice has this feature um, on, as in you, you've reached this sort of, um, active threshold, then they can use this message GP to contact your practice. Mm -hmm. And how much use are you seeing with message GP and I guess integrating the systems with it? Because I can definitely see how that can be, um, you know, supercharging, I guess, the primary secondary care discussion interface tooly thing. <laughs> there, there is in pockets of England, there are there's there's quite good use. So there's been a few ICSs which have put their hand up to do a pilot of Message GP. Um, so there's two or three ICSs which are using it quite well. But we haven't because of this need for um, GPs to be sort of active and happy to accept inbound. We haven't pulled it out widely um, because the last thing we want to do is. Um, force a new workflow on you which you're not yet happy with um so that yeah that would just open up clinical risk to things going missing mm -hmm. oh, cool so i know asking the question to some of our live viewers so about 50 percent of those that have responded have said they're currently using acumail 50 percent said they haven't i hope that's going to change following watching this particular live stream in terms of demonstration of how the tool can work and stuff i can absolutely see the benefits of having a direct communication tool um, with uh, other partners, whether that's secondary care, community care, et cetera, and that kind of stuff and things. Um, I guess there are some challenges in, obviously, as a company trying to run this, knowing every single potential referral pathway that exists in every single practice and locality and area. Blah, that sounds chaotic to, to me. I guess, is there any ways that practices can help understand that um, better so that it makes the processes easier? What would you recommend practices do to try and streamline i guess that aspect of the fact that it can only work based on the referral pathways that exist that one is one we haven't quite cracked yet i would say um and it's something that is in our our long-term future we hope to um have so in that directory that we showed we are hoping at some point in the next year to build a function that people can claim their own contact so let's say that Rob worked in community care, he could claim a contact on our system 
and then update that contact with this is how you could you, you need to send referrals to me it's during these times you can ex expect responses in this time frame and this is the pathway and this is the form we are not quite there yet and there's a lot of work to do to get there but that is a future that we hope to create at the moment however um the only offering we can give is that we um the majority of our users find that acumel is most useful for for community and imaging not yet as many acute settings because that's primarily ers which again we hope to integrate with this year cool um and i guess you just sparked up a couple of questions i had in my head then so is there a file size limit in terms of sending stuff through acumel because i appreciate obviously with um sms platforms there's a text message limit but then obviously there's a file size limit when it comes to photos and stuff. I guess, is there similar for Acumel? There is. So there's no limit on the, the character count. On the attachment size, you can attach as many number of, email, of attachments you would like, provided the whole amount stays under 20 megabytes. Um, that is a that's a threshold we're reviewing based on some system changes, but at the moment it's 20 megabytes. Okay. So roughly what would that mean to, I guess, clinicians, is that like 10 documents, two photos on average? It, it, yeah, exactly. Yeah, sort of, I'd say like three or four photos and yeah, multiple documents. It's, it's not a limit that we hear causes any problems. Fine, great. So, Thank you, team, for your help and understanding Acumel, in particular, you know, the newest part of the Acurix family that's available to everybody and stuff. Um, I know that I've learned a bit watching this session. It's a function I've not kind of fully dipped my toe in, but I think there's definitely uses I can see in my head. Um, definitely keen to know how it continues to develop and particularly some of that safe working stuff. I know, particularly in general practice, many practices are looking at how they can you know, manage safe working effectively and some of that communication uh, support in terms of how this could use i think for me is a really powerful tool to help support that and stuff but also obviously in terms of patient referrals speeding up the process that advice and guidance process i know many places are looking at as well this can definitely see to, to work i think in some ways more effectively than some of the other resources we've got in terms of managing all that kind of stuff and things if people did want to contact you about more information and stuff where would you recommend is the best place for them to go so i would Firstly, I would say, please do contact us. We, we always really, really do crave your feedback. Um, so our the best port of call, I would say, would be our, our wonderful support team, um, which you can either find on acrix.com or um, acrix.support at nhs.net. Or one thing that we are we're trialing specifically in our team is we have a new feedback tool, um, which um, you can access from Acumail. There's a little suggest an improvement at the bottom. If you click that, you'll go to a new tool. And then it's basically an ideas board where um, a lot of our users have ha started having discussions with us. So you can submit an idea, you can comment on it. And what myself, Rob, some of the engineers in our team or researchers all tend to get involved. And then you can vote on those ideas so that we get an idea of of what the biggest problem out there is. Um, so an example being of the if people would like teams in the inbox to help manage that workload, please jump on there, let us know, and we can have a discussion with you there. Yeah, please do. There's already been some really, really good feedback coming through there, um, which is already steering the direction of some of our some of our upcoming development. So the more, more you add on there, the more we can do. So please give us a look. Thank you. If other people do want to check out some of the information, so we are have, like I said, this is the third of uh, three streams that we've done over the past few months, looking at the various different functions and tools within Acurix. First one looking at, I guess, how to get started and use the basics. The second one, a lot more detail on some of the additional functions, particularly the flurries and that kind of stuff and how you can use that in practice. I know from my perspective, that's one of the things we're focusing on, particularly with a lot of the access challenges that almost every practice across the whole country is having to deal with. So if you do want to check out that information, have a look. This way, it's probably going to be coming up and stuff on the channel and stuff. And as always, we're here to help tech enhance your primary care and learning, and we will catch you in the next episode. Thank you very much to the team for joining us today. Catch you later.